and Social Entrepreneurship for Catholic Charities USA. Uh, and I'm here today not only in that role, but also as a member of the steering committee of, of SEEK. Um, so for those of you that are not uh, familiar with SEEK or are not involved in some way, uh, we want to just encourage you to get to know the group a little bit more. SEEK is a non-incorporated group. It's a, it's a global network of institutions and investors that are seeking to expand the practice of impact investing uh, among Catholic institutions. Uh, so we're a peer-to-peer -peer network of investors just like yourselves that uh, where we can come together to ask questions, to share advice, uh, to learn from one another, and to, uh, as, as we each kind of work through the process of, of encouraging our institutions or working through uh, whatever kind of investments that we might have uh, to increase those positive impacts of those investments over time. Um, but, you know, we all know we have to navigate really practical and technical issues around this process. Um, so uh, we're excited to have our guests today. We're going to, we'll share a little bit more and introduce the presentation as we go. Um, so if you're not involved with uh, SEEK in some way, I want to encourage you to join and come out to one of our upcoming regional gatherings. We have uh, regional dinners going on around the country over the next few months uh, that you're always welcome to participate in. So you can learn more about SEEK and sign up to to gather a newsletter and other information about it at catholicimpact.org. That's catholicimpact.org. So uh, today we have the, the pleasure of spending the next hour or so with uh, Pam Schmidt and Ed Gerardo of Bon Secours. Uh, whether through their investments in affordable housing or access to healthy food or job creation activities, I, I think you'll be inspired by uh, the kinds of projects that they've been able to put together and the impact that they've had in, in the communities that they, that they serve and work within. Um, it's a very holistic approach, and I think, you know, we're very interested as Catholic Charities, and I know many members at, at SEEK have really looked up to Bon Secours for what they've been able to do with their portfolio. So, as we go through this time, we'll have a fair amount of time for Q&A at the end, uh, but feel free to uh, chat your questions as we go, and we'll organize them and, and bring them up to the guests, and then we'll also open up for, the, for questions from the audience uh, as we get towards the end of the, the, end of the hour. Uh, you know, as we transition into the presentation today, it's our tradition to always uh, really kind of center us at the beginning of these presentations with a prayer and to remind us really why we're here and, and why we do this work. Um, so to begin, I want to uh, just start off with a, a brief kind of reflection and prayer and a riff on a, a very old prayer that's uh, attributed to St. Francis, um, but we maybe modernized a little bit for the conversation today. So uh, let's take a moment just to, to, to uh, calm our minds and, and remember that we're always in the presence of God and the work we're doing has, uh, has significance, uh, particularly today. Join me in prayer for a second. Lord, uh, make us in our organizations, our investments, instruments of your peace. Uh, where there is hatred, let us invest in love. Where there is offense, let us invest in pardon. Where there is war, let us invest in peace. Where there is doubt, let us invest with faith. Where there is despair, let us invest in hope. Where there is darkness, let us invest in light. Grant us that we may not so much seek to be lifted up as to lift up others. Grant us wisdom to see and courage to act. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, to introduce our guests today, I want to turn it over to Jake uh, Barnett, a founding member of the Catholic Impact Investing Collaborative Steering Committee and an institutional investment specialist with Greystone, the consulting division of Morgan Stanley. So Jake, take it away. Thanks, Matt. Um, so yeah, my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce our two panelists here today. Thank you both, Ed and Pam, for making the time to speak. I'll uh, give you a brief background. Ed is the former director uh, for community development and social investments for Bon Secure, and is now consulting with organizations on impact investment with community development. Um, and along with his treasury service colleagues at Bon Secure, he established the community investment program 10 years ago. Pam Schmidt is the current acting vice president of treasury services for Bonk's core health system. So as Matt said, we um, are going to feel free to participate and chat your Q and A at us. We'll be tracking that the entire time and there will be plenty of time for questions at the end. In the interim though, I'm gonna turn it over to Adam Pam. 
Great. Great. Well, good morning, everyone, and, and thank you for having us. Um, Ed and I are simply delighted to be here today and to share with you kind of our journey in, in community investing and impact investing. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Bon Secours Health System. Um, you know, we are um, a Catholic not-for-profit health system located predominantly on the eastern seaboard in west to Kentucky. Uh, we are were founded by the Sisters of Bon Secours, who are um, Order of Religious Women out of Paris, France in the 1800s and um, they were really revolutionary and very progressive for their time. They were the first, one of the first orders of re women religious to ever take health care into the home of those they needed. So much like we see today offering um, home care and greater access to, to those we need. We're a health system of about $3 billion in revenue, $1.3 billion in unrestricted um, investable assets. We're in six states, 19 hospitals, and um, five long long-term uh, care centers. Um, we have exciting news here at Bon Secours Health System. On May 21st, we entered into a letter of intent with Mercy Health out of Cincinnati, Ohio, um, to join and become um, what will be the largest Catholic health system east of the Mississippi River. We are a socially responsible investor here at Bon Secours Health System, and our um, our platform really kind of has has three legs. Um, we um, have um, investment screens, we do shareholder advocacy, and we have uh, our community investment program, which we'll spend the majority of the time talking about today. Um, you know, we really recognize that in support of our, our mission and support of being a Catholic entity, we need to put kind of our money where our mouth is and invest in things and promote things that, that do good for, for people, that do good for the environment, and that do good for, for humankind um, at large. We understand that we have this um, responsibility to steward our assets um, within the context of the social teachings of the Catholic Church and um, making sure that what we do promotes kind of a systemic change to improve the health and well-being of the communities and the individuals um, that we serve. Just briefly, you know, investment screens, it's, it's kind of kind of an old tried and true way of, of socially responsible investing. Um, we have a list of, of things that we don't want to invest in, and those would be things that really are contrary to the social teachings of the church, you know, abortifacients and stem cell research. Uh, we don't invest in tobacco companies. Tobacco companies uh, produce products that make um, individuals sick and drive healthcare costs up, so we don't want to support those. Um, we don't invest in, in gaming. Gaming really um, seems to prey on those that are, that most um, that can't afford it at most kind of a social economic deterrent and human exploitation. Our sisters are very passionate about putting a stop to to uh, labor, forced labor, as well as um, as human trafficking. Um, the advocacy side. Um, while we can say we are not going to own certain things, uh, we really do find that the advocacy side, the shareholder advocacy side, is much more powerful. Um, you, it's it's much better to engage with a company or an organization to try to promote change, uh, to try to promote them to see a different point of view. And we've been very successful in, in the work that we've done here, really partnering with our colleagues at um, at the Interface Center on Corporate Responsibility um, and the and the Sisters of Bon Secours. So active engagement and dialogue, um, talking at shareholder meetings really, I think, is, is very, very impactful and, and highly successful. The third leg of our stool is really our community investment program and our impact investment program. And, you know, the goal of the program is really to make investments with institutions and or projects that promote access to jobs, housing, food education, and health care for low-income and or minority communities, really kind of, um, you know, serving that whole notion of population health which we're all fully immersed in, in today. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Ed Gerardo. Thanks, Pam. So, and I, I'm uh, pleased to see that several of my colleagues over the years are participants on today's call. So it's always good to know, uh, and they're supportive of our work as I am of theirs. So on this next uh, slide, you see a, a population health chart. Um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, was behind its creation. Um, the reminder to us, and, and this is not only, this is an explanation not only that our justification lies in Catholic social teaching and our mission as a Catholic entity, but more specifically as a health system. And it was with um, not the creation of this, uh, but the thinking around this is that many of the health uh, status 
influences on populations are upstream from actual health behaviors and clinical care. We call those social uh, determinants of health. Uh, here it's represented as social and economic factors, as well as the built environment. And you can see to the right that whether it's in the area of, of education, employment and income, uh, particularly the need for increased median income, family support services, uh, community safety, as well as the environment, uh, these are all to extend at least 50%, if not more, determining people's health status. So it becomes logical for us to find ways. Uh, we have our Healthy Communities Program, which is intentional about working with vulnerable communities, rising, raising up leadership to try and improve the factors, not always health factors directly, but the social determinants that can influence people's long-term uh, mortality and morbid morbidity. So we said, why not use our investments to make an impact on various social and economic factors? Uh, and I'll, on the next slide, you'll see here that there are plenty of opportunities for investment purposes. Again, this is another way of displaying that the community's health and wellness has at least, if not 10, uh, at least these 10 factors, which are include access to healthy foods, uh, access to public transit and active transportation, affordable housing, economic opportunities, uh, safe neighborhoods and public spaces, the environment's quality and green and sustainable development practices. So many of you are probably familiar with uh, a simple uh, explanation where they will show that the difference between living in two different zip codes that are less than 10 miles apart can often be 15 years of age. So we wanted to use our investments as a way, or our potential investments, as a way of influencing people's access to affordable housing, to impacting food deserts, to creating green and safer environments for people. So with that in mind, it's the Bon Secours and hopefully other health systems intention to use as many tools in the, in the kit as possible to uh, bring about improved health status. So I'll stop there and let, we'll get into the meat of the uh, program now with Pam. Great, thanks, Ed. So what is this community um, investment program? Um, you know, I, I will say this is, um, we, we had a start in this about, right about the turn of the century, in this current century. And we, um, we, we made an investment through the Small Business Administration um, through kind of a partnership structure with a, with a GP. And it didn't end well. Um, the, the GP had some challenges, um, uh, legal and uh, just not really minding the shop as they should have. And um, we, we lost our investment. So it took us a little bit to, to kind of exit that. And once we did, it, we had to kind of rethink how we wanted to go about this. So what we're going to talk about today was really our, our 10 year journey on, on where we are today. So, um, you know, our program is a decade in the making. And today we have about 30 million um, placed in, in the program program invested across about 24 uh, different managers. And as I noted earlier, this is this community investment program is, is one of the three legs of our socially responsible investment um, platform. And we really want to invest with organizations and, and funds that um, conduct themselves in a manner consistent with the values of BISHI, of Bunsker Health System, and also the social teachings of the church. We have a couple funding priorities that um, have been um, have been laid out as criteria from our, our executive management team. And one is um, we have a passion for investing dollars in our local communities um, where we provide healthcare or healthcare related services. And we want to use these dollars to promote healthy communities, which is a strategic um, initiative for, for the health system. And we want to make sure that the dollars we invest are impacting those, those that we serve. Um, Ed, the next slide, please. Our community investment program, you know, it has several objectives. The key objective is we have about 1.3 billion of investable assets. We want to allocate 5% of those investable assets to this program, which, which now at 1.3 billion is about $65 million. And we are about halfway, halfway there with our, our 30, 35 million 
um, we want institutional quality type investments diversified across managers, risk type geography. So think about in when you have a stock or a bond portfolio, you're not investing in just um, in Apple or you're not just investing in JP Morgan bonds. Uh, you're investing across a what you want to invest across a wide array of uh, securities and companies so that you can get good diversification. Think about that the same way here in a community investment program. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. When we started out in this program, preservation of capital was absolutely key, and that was probably driven by our, our initial foray um, closer to the turn of the century, and that, that did not end as well as what we had hoped. So we always have to tell people and remind people that we're talking to about the program. This is not a grant program. It's not a charitable donation. We fully expect to make a return on our capital and we expect our capital to be uh, returned at the end of our, our commitment. Um, you know, we have a financial rate of return that we set for this portfolio at two to two and a half percent. And, and some may say, well, that's pretty low given, you know, the opportunity you may have in the stock market or the bond market. And that, that is true. But what I will say is think about it like this. These are, these are loans that we're making. So they're not subject to the market volatility that you would see in a stock or a bond portfolio. We're simply clipping our coupon. We're collecting our interest payments. We're collecting our principal and we're reinvesting investing those proceeds um, on and on and on. So we kind of had, I would say, kind of a startup phase that probably lasted, I would say, somewhere probably about, about seven years or so, and then we went kind of into an operational phase. We developed an internal, what we call our green revolving fund, and our green revolving fund is really um, to take uh, capital projects that we have and look at those in terms of, and through a lens of environmental sustainability. So investing our community and impact, our community investment program dollars, our impact investing in capital projects that will help promote sustainable environment. So water and energy. Um, it could be changing out kind of light fixtures to new LED, very energy efficient light fixtures, changing over our, uh, a heat pump um, to some kind of more water efficient type type plan. Um, we're also making our foray into direct investments and Ed's going to talk to you about um, one of those uh, that we've, uh, we've done. Ed? Thanks, Pam. Um, so many times people will say, and I don't know that this is the case for our participants today. Uh, many of you are already doing some sort of impact investing. But for those who haven't started it and they're wondering, well, how do I get uh, past thinking about it? Uh, and what we've put together here is five kind of sequential blocks of activity from creating a shared vision, which I'll start with. Uh, Pam will talk a little about working with finance. We'll discuss how to you know, get more narrow and find some focus. And then we will talk about a little bit later on two options, either indirect investing or direct investing. And of course, you will need some documents along the way uh, to make this happen. So let me start with the shared vision. I think for most of the uh, participants on this call, um, the vision starts with the mission statement of the organization. Uh, it's what drives the organization. Sometimes organizations have very narrow visions, uh, at least among health systems, uh, they're particular to patient care. But I think for at least Catholic health systems and uh, other Catholic entities, we, we root our mission as a much broader one and, and our mandate is actually uh, to you know, transform the world in lots of different ways. Um, having said that, uh, sometimes in the finance area, uh, the, the participants, it could be a CFO, uh, it could be other players, are, think, are very keen to accomplishing the goals and objectives of that area. So it's always important, at least from my perspective, that the organization's mission and strategies are influencing the chief executives, be they finance people or uh, operations people. Uh, and I would say, again, in a, in a wider organization, um, the impact of the board is important. So you wanna have your executives on, on board, you wanna have your board, leadership in support of using your investments in, in this way. It's part of their overall capability and stewardship. Uh, and from our perspective, we think this has a quadruple effect. So we have an opportunity, if we do some investments, say in affordable housing, we have the opportunity to do some improvement in people's health outcomes because they're, now they're in a safer place and we can provide some services, healthcare services in those facilities. 
we're doing community development, uh, particularly whenever we're engaged in vulnerable communities with one of our projects. Our projects normally and logically have an environmental impact. So we're either cleaning or up a vacant lot or we're transforming uh, some footprint. We're even advocating uh, with policymakers about the environment. And rather than being a grant, it has the opportunity to generate a financial return. And in particular, that financial return has the opportunity in subsequent investments to keep doing good. So we, we see a quadruple effect with that. Pam, do you want to talk about the finance side? Sure. So, um, you know, I think uh, we really had a, a great relationship working with Ed um, on, on this program. And I think just a couple of things I would mention is, um, it takes a little bit to stand this up and really get kind of um, the mechanics of it down, kind of working behind all the all the work of these underlying investments. Um, and it takes some it takes some processes, establishing kind of sound processes and procedures to work through it. Um, I think too that um, making sure that folks understand how this really fits into your portfolio and that you're doing very similar due diligence on these investments as you are doing on a regular investment manager where you would, you would be saying to them, here's $50 million and invested in the stock market. You're doing kind of the same type of due diligence. You know, who's making the decisions at the firm? Do they have good governance practices? Are, are there are there policies and practices in, in, inside to safeguard my assets? You know, since this is a loan program, uh, do, are they adequately, adequately reserved to, to make sure that there's a, a, a backstop um, should the project go bad? Ed? Okay, um, this is a straightforward uh, section finding focus. It's really not possible for all of us to do everything that needs to be done. So it's important that every organization identify areas it could be health conditions, it could be economic conditions, it could be housing conditions. A lot of that is driven by where your organization, the population that it's serving. But the conversation actually needs to happen because there's lots of places where investments can be made and you can find yourself, so to speak, scattered, uh, which in some respects may be a, a trial and error approach, but to the extent that the conversation occurs about what are our priorities? What do we want to focus on? Is it a geographic focus? Clearly for uh, Bon Secours, we have, we identified three international communities, Peru, Haiti, and South Africa and initially for investments. We recognize there are other places that, that needed assistance, but we thought those were places, and we look for organizations that we could collaborate with to make an impact in those communities. Secondly, I would say you need to think about your criteria. Uh, for, for success. Um, clearly, Pam referenced earlier that preservation of capital was the number one priority. We were willing, as a criteria, to take a more concessionary position with regards to the return. So instead of getting market returns, we were willing to take, you know, one and a half uh, or two, two and a quarter percent return on our investment. So setting out some criteria, be it financial criteria or project-related criteria, are important. And then tracking, tracking outcomes and goals is, is, is also an element of establishing success in this. So we'll, we'll move to the documents and then we'll talk about some options. Great. Thanks, Ed. So in terms of documentation, um, what I would say is it can be document intensive. So what what we have found to be very beneficial for our program is we worked with our in-house legal to develop kind of a bon secours, if you will, model loan agreement as well as, as a promissory note. And so what that does is when we enter into a new a new agreement with an with a fund or an investment, um, we're able to use consistent documentation. So it really makes our process internally much more streamlined. We're not having to uh, go through individual documents each time we make a new investment. I think that is really key to getting this program stood up and really helping to streamline kind of the the back office administrative work. Um, if you will. And then I would just say, make sure you ask a lot of questions of the folks you're investing your money with. Make sure that they understand what your objectives are and what you expect to get out of the program. I think one of the things that Ed said is really key, trying to understand from them, you know, how you get back and, and, and data back to, 
to figure out, is the investment really having the impact uh, that you want uh, to do? I think the other really important thing as you're kind of going through this process is, is make sure you understand their loan loss reserves and, and ask that question of how many times have you had one of these investments go, go bad? Those are all great due diligence things that your executive management team as you're presenting these forward are, are going to want to know. Thanks, Pam. I would just also mention that we had, we created an application uh, process for this. So we had a series of maybe 12 questions, including asking for financial documents, as well as a list of board members. And then uh, in this case, Ross Darrow and I would, would vet the various uh, participants. So when we're making a loan to uh, a CDFI or another entity, we wanted to be able to vet that organization and get a comfort level. So um, we're happy to share. I, I'm sure Pam would be willing to share um, any documents that we've created. So let's talk about the, uh, the various options that are available. And, and Pam, you want to start with the, um, the indirect uh, options? Sure. Sure. Thanks, Ed. So we started this program really investing through large, sophisticated um, third-party intermediaries. So like um, a Mercy Housing, a Calvert, a community housing partner, folks where we could, they had a proven track record. They had millions and millions of dollars out in their program. We were um, part of a pooled fund. So uh, the risk, if you will, is spread across a greater investment Base. The other thing about it, 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 it provides a lot of scale. And so, um, you know, your, your dollars can have an impact um, kind of on a, much, on a much bigger level, if you will. Um, and this, the, when you invest in a larger fund like that, you may not be able to get project specific, um, but you can at least express a desire to have your dollars attributed as we do to a certain area um, are one of the markets in, in which we serve. Um, CDFIs, uh, community development financial institutions are not-for-profit financial institutions and they provide great access um, to, to loans as well as to, to, to tax credits. And Enterprise is one um, widely known, I think, in, in this space that, uh, that we invest with. Um, as we developed the program and as, as it matured, we found ourselves really looking to smaller, less sophisticated uh, players um, just so we can continue to put money at work. I think that is one of, um, one of the things that uh, you always have to do. You have to be looking for where your next investment is going. There's also this notion of direct investments, and, and as we stated, we're just starting to kind of get down the path of direct investment, really where, where we're backing a very specific project or interest. You know, it, 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 it does have greater risk, but it also provides greater potential benefit. Uh, we could have more of a direct impact, really, of, of the community we serve and, and, their, and their health outcomes, if you, if you, if you will. Um, some options of direct um, investments might be a bridge loan, and, and we do have a project where uh, we we did that actually. Um, we're really looking for catalysts um, as we do this, long-term partnerships, and um, we're going to talk about a multi-investor um, financial stacking uh, approach. We haven't done it yet, but certainly very interested in in uh, in taking that next step. And Ed's going to walk us through some of the some of the great work that uh, that's been going on here at Bonscore. Thanks, Pam. So in terms of a, a bridge loan, this was a direct investment. And, and again, as Pam said, we spent several years going through uh, financial intermediaries to preserve our, our capital investment. Now that we had uh, $30 million invested, we could start to look at some opportunities. And there's an organization that does affordable housing in the uh, Commonwealth of Virginia called Virginia Supportive Housing. They were fortunate enough uh, to apply and get tax credits uh, for two different projects, one in Norfolk, Virginia, and one um, which was a new project uh, for affordable housing uh, that was going to be integrated into some commercial, so it's mixed-use housing. Um, and secondly, they, were, they wished to expand on a project in Richmond, New Clay Housing, uh, which has been a SRO or single-room occupancy facility for the last 25 years. Uh, so while they had tax credits, many of you may be familiar uh, in the tax credit space, is that you really don't get to draw down those funds until you get past some of the pre-development expenses. So Virginia Supportive Housing was looking in essence for uh, a short-term loan of 24 months, actually probably less 18 months, but we provided a quarter of a million dollars over 24 months 
probably at uh, two to two and a quarter percent, so that they could initiate both of these projects simultaneously, so to speak. They didn't have to wait till they got one completed and had the tax credits in hand to start working on the other. So that became in, from a, a time frame of 24 months in terms of an amount, uh, in terms of uh, their long and successful history in the affordable housing space, it became, I'll say, a no-brainer, a relatively safe investment option for Bon Secours on the direct uh, lending space. Secondly, here's, here's one of my favorite. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about the catalytic piece of this. And many of you have um, grant money available. And so this was a kind of a combination of both grants as well as lending capacity, as well as partners. So here is a dilapidated, for lack of a better word, um, and I love our sign, good help is coming soon. Dilapidated kind of gas station, car repair place, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, it was literally across the street or, um, within view of Richmond Community Hospital in the East End. And so we, as part of our mission to, and you've probably read in the newsletter that we have made various investments in the East End of Richmond. So from a catalytic perspective, we thought if we could transform this property and develop it so that tenants could occupy it, uh, creating a stream of revenue through leases, that we had an opportunity to send a signal and continue the catalytic work of uh, transforming a vulnerable community. So this is the way it looked. And now we have the Sarah Garland Jones Center, which it's essentially the same property. It has a cafe, We've worked, we've partnered with an organization uh, that works with um, teenagers and young adults, and they've created an instructional kitchen. So we're teaching folks how to be entrepreneurial um, and create uh, responsibility around jobs. We've identified a, a couple of different tenants, and we work, lo worked with the CDFI LISC, or Local Initiative Support Corporation, to provide the technical assistance and the training that's needed to be in a in a business plan so we have some community program space and we have some wonderful here's i think the kitchen uh and here you see some of the young adults that are um, receiving instruction on how to be in the food business and um not necessarily because of this but many of you have probably read recently how richmond has become a bit of a a foodie capital. So if you're looking for a nice meal, I certainly encourage you to stop by um, the Sarah Garland Jones Center Cafe. So that was a catalytic endeavor. Again, we, we did some grant money around that. We did not a lot. Uh, and because our grants are much smaller than our investment loans, we were able to lend money. And then we partnered with LISC and other community organizations. And I think this is the kind of stuff that all of us are probably capable of doing on whatever scale we wish. Third, and this is probably what Bon Secours is so most well known for, is our housing. So for the last 20 years, uh, Bon Secours in the west side of Baltimore has been in, in the affordable housing projects or, or spaces. Um, so we took an initial uh, investment of $681,000, bought 31 row houses, and made this happen after we applied for tax credits. This was some 20 years ago. But because we were able to recoup that investment, we created a revolving fund. This is the third example, uh, the beauty of community investments. And then we partnered with Enterprise Homes and we've gone on to do 11 projects um, and created more than 800 affordable housing units uh, in low income communities. Our most recent set of partners have been faith communities because they have a lot of older adults in need of residence, particularly for low income people. Uh, and those faith communities, have, uh, we've been able to create child care centers in some of these affordable housing sites. We've uh, created over 750 jobs for people, and we've registered more than 1,100 uh, credit union accounts. So we're doing a multifaceted approach all around where housing is the centerpiece of that. And that initial $680,000 has been, you could say, flipped over uh, 11 times and now we have a hundred over a hundred million dollars worth of project improvements in the west side of Baltimore. So um, Pam, do you want to talk a little bit about the multi-investor approach? Sure. This is kind of, um, I would 
say kind of a, a, a next um, a next interest of ours. Um, although um, when I was talking to Ed about this, it, it strikes me as um, there's like there's no one body or source out there where you could go to find someone who can aggregate all these investors together for you. So I will say this is a lot more sophisticated. It's a lot more challenging. It, it does pose different levels of risk and, and reward than, than simply dressed, investing through intermediaries. So when we think about a multi-investor approach, we think about kind of, um, I'll start from the bottom up, we think about public dollars. So public dollars coming from um, cities, um, states, potentially grant money, maybe access to tax credits. So think about those public dollars as being the floor. They're trying to stand up this investment. And the investment could be uh, large scale uh, regentrification or um, a rejuvenation of, of a certain business corridor or um, uh, some blocks like we did in Baltimore with, with buying the Roan homes. Um, you know, those public dollars are really there to help kind of support um, really kind of the folks in the community ensuring that the redevelopment of this particular area doesn't force those that are live there that are indigenous to that area, doesn't force them out of, of the neighborhoods and what they live in. I think that the second tier is really where we would see Bunce Core Health System kind of coming in and doing more of kind of a direct type of loan. You know, when we think about what kind of return we would want on that, we would probably want somewhere in the five, I'm thinking five to, to seven uh, percent uh, range and we would want you know certain criteria tied to that 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 perhaps for us to invest we would may, want to make sure that if this was an affordable housing type project that a certain percentage of those affordable housing units would stay affordable to the, the folks that that live in the area or perhaps that at the end of the day um, there's a community center or some type of, of job training program that that's developed for the community kind of the third level of investors and are your private investors. These really would be like classic, I'll just say the word capitalists that are looking for, you know, an, a rate of return similar to that of they would find in the equity markets, maybe 11, uh, even up to 17 or 18 percent. Um, and they are looking to see that, you know, that their investment is um, going to make uh, money for them. They want to see that there's a, there's a floor, which are your public dollars, and that there's a healthy middle uh, on which they can rely uh, to make sure the investment is um, is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, this is going to take a little bit, I think, for us really to get to get into this, but it's definitely the, the the next place for us to consider going, particularly as we look at some of the projects um, that we have across uh, the markets in which we serve, some being right here in Baltimore, that would be a, a great example for um, a project like this. Um, so I'm excited. I think this is a great opportunity for the health system to kind of to move into this next phase and become even more sophisticated in, in, it, in what it's doing. So, Encourage folks that if you live in a in a significant urban area, this is a these are ways to maybe stimulate economic development that is um, inclusive more so than than other approaches. So you just keep that in mind. Pam. Thanks, Ed. Yeah. So you know, um, any like anything that you do, there's always challenges and there's always lessons learned. I think one of our challenges at this point is really trying to find. Us continue sourcing investments in the community in which we serve, particularly through intermediaries, which is why the direct option is starting to look more attractive. Um, our CEO has very strong passion for serving either our global ministries and or our communities here, here domestically. Um, and then there's complexities that emerge as, as this program grows. Um, it's the record keeping of it. It's making sure all your documents are up to date. It's making sure you're getting paid when you're supposed to. Um, it's really resources. And a lot of the reporting that this program uh, we produce for this is, is ad hoc. It's, it's done on spreadsheets. So there's always that risk of, uh, you know, the, the person who knows that spreadsheet the best, that key man risk of what if they get hit by the bus that day on the way to work. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot that goes with that. And I don't know if you had other challenges you wanted to mention. No, and we, we addressed, I think, some of those challenges, Pam, because we split the responsibilities between both our treasury services and our mission services at Bonds Accord. But this is, I, and I recognize various faith organizations may have this as, a, some, as an FTE or one person's responsibility, but as Pam said, sometimes sharing the responsibilities helps mitigate some of the challenges. Mm -hmm. And then lessons learned, I think, you know, um, 
speaking, you know, historically for Bon Secours, um, as I said, right about the turn of the century, we made one investment through the Small Business Administration, and, and it turned out very bad. So we learned that diversifying our investments was was a much better option for us. So we spread that that risk across multiple multiple counterparties, if you will. And then patience. Um, it takes. You can see it. It's taken us ten years to get where we're at today, and I think I think we have a phenomenal track record, and and the work that um, has been done is just exceptional. But um, we, we didn't do it overnight and we don't want to do it overnight. We want to make sure that we keep that focus on making meaningful, high impact investments in projects that, again, can, um, can promote the health and well-being of the communities in which we serve. Thanks, Pam. I think uh, we're going to open it up because there are probably some questions out there that people may have or comments and we welcome some alternative thinking as well. Jake, you're still on mute. Thank you, Matt. Um, <laughs> so we have some questions in the Zoom webinar chat that we're going to work through uh, sequentially. If you have anything to add, you can also raise your hand if you'd like to just uh, ask your question verbally. But to start off with, um, does Bon Secure from Kelly Green, my colleague over at Greystone, does Bon Secours include the 5% as part of their total portfolio? And is the protection of capital that you have within that 5% also applicable to the 95% of total investable assets? Mm. A uh, great question. It is included. The 5% is included in our total portfolio, both from an asset allocation perspective as well as in a total return. The 95% that's in the pool, you know, um, we obviously set out a risk return um, structure that we that we want to follow, and um, it is not uh, is not subject to full uh, protection of uh, a capital. We're broadly diversified across multiple asset classes. Great. Um, and then from Frank Sherman, who's with uh, Seventh Generation, the um, ICCR group that you all, many are likely familiar with. One question he had is, what's the expertise and overhead costs associated with the community investing effort? Hmm. And do you want to take that? So uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I think it's possible, um, you know, both, uh, well, Ross, my colleague in Treasury, obviously has a a strong financial background. I had an, an MBA uh, in the mission area. Um, at the same time though, I think these are roles that people can be educated towards. Um, and there are many, in many congregations, there's usually an individual with at least a financial bent or uh, some discipline that can, in effect, do the spreadsheet pieces of it. It's the evaluation of, if you go the direct investment route, it's the evaluation of the individual investment that becomes complicated. And I would, uh, you know, per Pam's comment early on in our first investments, I said this, I used to say we, we became something like venture capitalists. So we're really pretty good at evaluating healthcare opportunities, but when you, we got outside of our sweet spot, it becomes problematic. So if somebody from an expertise perspective, this is why you use CDFI, uh, who can vet an individual project and the likelihood that it will succeed. Great. Pam, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? You know, I would just say that I think too. I think what what also helped with our our journey, this ten year journey, was as um, our treasury shop. You know, I, I when I came to Bon Secours thirteen years ago, um, we really didn't have a, a a true treasury operation. Which over the years we've developed and it's become more sophisticated, which really helped I think us then leverage kind of that expertise and helping with uh, the, the the vetting and the the uh, due diligence, if you will, of these and in, in community investments. Great. Um, so we have another question from Rabbi Jacob Siegel, who's with the Jaylins Investor Network, and he asked, did you encounter challenges early in the process, getting board, investment committee, et cetera, on board with this initiative? And how did you overcome those challenges? Pam, do you want to start or do you want me? Go ahead, Ed. So I, I think there, well, Philosophically, we'll go back to the first, uh, there was a, a desire to be intentional. I would say that the community, the congregation of Bon Secours, wanted to find a way to accomplish this. We, we know many Catholic congregations 
that use a portion of their investment for community investment purposes. So we were looking, and we also know that there were other health systems that had, had stepped into this space. So the, the underpinnings of it made sense, but the process by which we had to, the implementation of it, it was certainly, we had two different experiences with that. So when we didn't succeed the first time, we found that that was problematic. We had to take a time out and rebuild the thinking around what was the right approach to get started with this. So that being said, I would say on the whole, as a Catholic institution, board members are inclined to find ways to, to pursue this innovation. So I'll leave it at that. Right. I'll, I'll just add to that. Think about the timing of when we started this program. We were, this program was beginning on the cusp of the financial, of the great financial crisis. So, um, you know, we were making our first investments in 2008 when the whole capital market and the world as we knew it was imploding. So it was a little bit, um, it was a little bit scary, if you will, for our, our CFO to say, yes, you can give our money to somebody who we're going to entrust it with and hope they do good with it and get it returned one day. So, um, you know, timing, I think, can be everything. Um, but we persevered, and, and here we are today. Uh, to that point, I just add, so after the first couple of years of investing, I think it was the, the 2009 report, you know, Ross and I got to come to the uh, Pension Investment Committee. That's who we report to on this. And we, we were able to demonstrate, you know, two and a half percent return, whereas Pam was speaking to trying to bring from underwater a variety of other investments that we had. So it was actually, it, it, the timing in, in terms of justifying the program was actually quite nice. Mm -hmm. I have a question a little bit about that return, um, and particularly as a healthcare system. Um, have you done any kind of modeling or work on understanding the impacts, the financial impacts of these investments on the core business, the kind of health risks of the populations that you serve or other, you know, more clear linkages to social determinants? That's a great, great question. And, that, and therein lies all, so our expectation with the CDFIs is that they produce a report to us annually on presumably the impacts, not the financial impact or return, but the returns to the community. Clearly, in the case of affordable housing, we know how many units and how many lives are, are transformed by being able to, to live in an affordable housing. Um, when it comes to economic development, you're, you're kind of trying, and I, I referenced the catalytic kind of efforts, you're trying to create ripples that have longer term impact across the community. So our expectation is the more that we do transformational investments in communities, the more likely that A, well, you could say crime rates decline, the more opportunity there is for transportation to come into that community. So we're trying to be opportunistic creators uh, mm -hmm. with our investments. Um, but all our CDFIs have to report to us, I'm, and I'm very pleased about some of the smaller ones because we're very intentional about the programs or the, invest, the, the lenders that they attribute our funds to, and, they, and they're very good at reporting to us. And we put out a report every three years talking about how our money has helped to transform communities. Hmm. That's helpful. There's another question uh, that just came in um, that from Kelly Green again. The, the, it says, the due diligence on these and all investments is critical. Would the speakers discuss how the allocation of internal resources and treasury and mission uh, might compare to other health systems in, traditional inv in a traditional investing structure? So I guess there was a couple questions around resource allocation and basically overhead um, of, of these processes in, in treasury and mission. You know, can you speak to that a little bit? You want to talk about treasury? <laughs> Sure. So, um, Ross Darrow, who, um, who was um, with us um, until about a month ago, um, he um, dedicated, uh, he was our, our manager, our director of kind of investments. So his whole role here at the health system was really overseeing the day-to-day the -day operations of the investment portfolio. So I want to say 
you know, depending on the time of year, but, you know, it could be sometimes up was up to 10 hours a week of his time, other times maybe, you know, a couple hours a month, just depending on kind of where we were in the investment cycle. I think, I think the thing that I would say is once you kind of get the program stood up and you get basic processes and procedures in place, the mm-hmm. time that he had to dedicate would take less. Now the time that he and Ed spent in sourcing investments, that would, t- that would take more. Yeah, and from the mission side of it, this was, this was one piece of the job description. So there was community benefits, there was healthy communities, there was, you know, IRS reporting on Schedule H, et cetera, that were in my, I'll say, portfolio of responsibilities. Um, the, we spent, a, the first year, we spent a fair amount of time, mostly over the summer, creating the documents and standing up the program. But that being said, we committed to making our investments, say, on April 1 and October 1. And we did all our vetting in the fall and winter and uh, sourcing opportunities as well as uh, follow-up conversations with those that already had our funds. So there were, you know, as Pam alluded to, there were probably some weeks where it was, you know, 10 or 11 hours of our work. And then I would say there were a whole month where it was simply you know, responding by occasional email. And that's how we wanted it because we had other responsibilities. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then one other question from uh, Frank Sherman. Are private investors taking advantage of public and foundation investment in those multi-investor projects to make better than market returns? So when you're talking about that capital stacking, Mm -hmm. um, are you seeing private investors kind of coming in to try and take that last best risk-adjusted return tranche? Mm -hmm. You know, I would say I still... I, I think the thing that's missing in this whole field is trying to find those investors and yeah. trying to get a, a pool of them. You know, I, I have this vision that there will someday will be a pool of private investors that you can access um, and to draw on uh, to support these projects. That's what I think the, the piece is missing. I think, I think there's probably private investors out there. They just don't know where to go to try to do this work. And yeah, thanks, Pam. So I think it's a local private investor, so to speak. Um, it may be uh, so, uh, and and probably uh, Frank Sherman's one of those people in Milwaukee. Um, so so um, with, if if there's an opportunity, I'll use um, a metro system for example. In DC or in Boston, periodically every couple of years, there's a new stop that's on the uh, metro line that's being created. And most of the studies indicate that these are highly attractive uh, areas or zones for commercial development. The trick is to uh, allow all uh, classes of people, so to speak, to be able to have access to that. And so you will find developers who want to be there. The trick is to find those who are willing to say, okay, I want to put 10 or 15% of the residents for the commercial economic space aside for local uh, residents. Uh, and that's why the that's why you need the second or the middle tranche as well as the lower tranche because you're offsetting in essence what they may be doing. But they're there. There there's there's there are commercial developers that want to do good as well as do well. So uh, Frank Sherman's uh, official response to that is quote, you're killing me Ed, end quote. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> I think <laughs> <laughs> an appreciative, uh, honest response. I know we're coming up towards the end of time. So um, I want to just kind of finish out with a question we oftentimes like to ask folks, and then I'll make some wrap up comments, which is, you know, for wherever the individuals on the call are on their impact journey, what's the one piece of advice from your experience that you would like to share with the broader group? Mm-hmm. I would say patience and perseverance. Uh, give yourself ample time uh, to get this going, and uh, and the reward I think is 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 great in the end. Yeah, and, and thank you, Pam. And, and my comment, align with that complimentary to it, is that it's doable. So lots of times, there are individuals and organizations that are, I'll say, uh, financially adverse, or <laughs> they don't want to have to deal with finance. But this is a great opportunity. And if you start small and be methodical, again, you don't have to have a PhD to step into this opportunity. And it can be very rewarding for an organization. 
Well, I just want to thank Ed and Pam again. Uh, really appreciated your comments and you both making the time to uh, speak to the group assembled. Um, for those of you interested in keeping involved in SEEK, um, I hope you have signed up for the website for regular updates. We're also going to be put, doing a bigger push for regional gatherings moving forward. So there's one in uh, West Coast towards the end of the month as well as one in the Midwest that should be happening uh, in the fall. Um, so we're looking forward to both of those conversations. Hope you can join us. And if you personally have a story to sh share with your institution, feel free to reach out um, through the website, info at catholicimpact.org. We're always interested in hearing from different types of institutions about what their impact journey has been like. So with that, thank you all so much for attending. Um, Matt, do you have anything to add? No, thank you, Ed and Pam. This has been really wonderful. I appreciate your being here today. Thank you for having great. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. You too. Bye.